Um, and so it looks like this, OK? So this is a bell curve, but not really bell curve. <laughs> this is easy grades curve, OK? <laughs> so um, most of the class is doing pretty well. Um, there's few people that are doing average, and then I have to figure out what's happening there. Um, so if you keep doing this like this, you should be good. That's uh, practice for you, free grades for you. Uh, so keep doing what you're doing. For the others that are on this side of the, 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 the curve, I guess practice a little bit more, OK? So this is for the two groups of Sarah. So that's not bad. I'm waiting for uh, Zoe's. Hopefully, it should be the same because you know it follows the general distribution, right? Um, obviously, for the midterm, uh, it's not going to be uh, as easy, but it will still look unlike, OK? Any questions about the quiz tutorial? No? OK. So for the midterm, I was asked uh, by one of your fellow students uh, what's going to be on there. So it's chapter 1 to 6. Okay, and if you're looking for an example of questions, that will be your tutorials. Okay, so similar stuff kind of. One and six, one to six. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the other thing, we'll probably split the class into two. I don't know how I'm going to do this, so I asked them to give me another rule, just so that we can, you know, spread people properly and I'll get one TA on each classroom and then I'll be running between here, the other class, and then ACSD office, okay? So that's for the midterm. You can bring your calculator, obviously, because um, we will might have some calculations to do, chi-square and all that stuff. Um, and, then, and then what else? Yeah, so that's pretty much it. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah, obviously, I'm not going to kill you with like 25 questions that are at the end of the list that I give you every tutorial, you know? <laughs> I'm probably not going to be able to solve it in one hour and 15 minutes, right? So it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah, um, I actually forgot two students. <laughs> Silly, and I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, I was supposed to look at the questions, but I'm overwhelmed. So. Just send, send me an email, it's better for me, okay? Because I can't keep track of all of that, okay? I try, but sometimes it doesn't work. Cool? So with that being said, I want to get back on something that our friend Pedro made me realize last week. And I guess I was sleeping a little bit, so I messed it up. Um, he asked me what happens if we have a negative interference uh, when we do the calculation 1 minus observed uh, double crossover over expected. And this actually can happen. Right? And the reason why this happens is a bit complex, but the DNA is not just kind of, you know, lining up like this, okay? So the molecular structure of the DNA is complex. Sometimes it does turns like this. So when one opens, it promotes uh, a crossover on the strand above, right? So that's why you have negative interference, where you observe more double crossovers than expected, okay? So if you have negative inter uh, positive interference, that means one crossover prevents the other one. If you have negative, it means that one promotes the other one. And this is just due to the 3D structure of DNA. For example, when a crossover will happen here, sometimes it will open the DNA in a way that it will promote its um, another crossover in a nearby region. Okay, So it's just how the DNA moves. So both scenarios are possible. Is that clear? Good. Yeah, so uh, I will probably make more mistakes like this, um, human after all, but uh, if you keep uh, reminding me, I will look after the lecture, okay? Good. So before we get into the topic of today, which is complex gene interactions, um, I want to just do another problem related to chi-square analysis because I realized that last lecture people were asking me about having a, the opposite hypothesis, which is that they are linked and how you would do that, okay? So we'll do that. Um, and then we'll get to the topic itself. As you also can see, the slides got much more nicer, okay? I actually uh, stopped being... Uh, so the beginning of the semester was kind of hard, but I was kind of doing everything super fast, but now they will look a little bit nicer and, you know, um, have more information on them, let's say. And then next semester, I guess I'll redo one to six 
for the new students. Okay, so let's look at this example where we have two genes. I'm not going to do the three genes because it will take too much time, but let's just imagine two genes um, that are uh, on either chromosome of the Drosophila on one of them or they're on separate chromosomes. We don't know, okay? But the scientists that are doing research on this, they suspect that they are linked and in a cis configuration, okay? So that's two keywords that you need to kind of keep in mind, linked and cis configuration. Does anyone remember what cis configuration means? Sorry? I can't hear you, but I will say the answer. <laughs> so if it's the two dominant alleles are on the same chromosome, okay? On the same homologue, not same chromosome, okay? Uh, so to test this hypothesis, they conducted a test cross. This is what usually you do, a, di a, a dihybrid test cross all the time, or trihybrid depending on if you're getting that big table with eight different rows um, for both genes. And then they believe that A and B are located on the same chromosome with a hypoth hypothetical genetic distance of 20 map units. Okay, maybe they got this distance from their head or they actually just did some other experiments and found the distance, okay? So here we have three important informations. Linked, cis configuration, 20 mapping units. Okay, so this is that. So they did this cross here with the test cross basically and then they obtained a thousand offsprings. Now they want to verify their hypothesis. So if you get a problem like this, uh, before I get into that, so the researchers, when they did their test cross, they found these progenies, okay? So 250 AB, 350 big A, small B, 300 small A, big B, and then 100 small A, small B, okay? So this is their observed um, genotypes. So how can you determine if these genes assort independently or not? So the first step is to actually make a hypothesis, right? So the scientists, their hypothesis is that they are linked and on the same, uh, on the same chromosome, okay? And then that we call the null hypothesis. And then just the opposite of that is called the alternative hypothesis, okay? So then they are not linked and they, uh, they assort independently, okay? So that's first thing. So if we say that they are linked, that's our hypothesis, then our expected progeny, we have to kind of think of it in regards to this hypothesis. So we say that they believe it's 20 mapping units and they have a thousand offsprings and it's in a cis configuration. So first things first, cis configuration means that the two dominant alleles are in the same homologue. So this is the parental and this is the parental because if you have big A, big B on the same, um, on the same uh, homologue, then small a, small b will be on the other homologue. And then these two are the crossovers. Big a, small b, and small a, big b. So then from there, you can kind of calculate the expected ratios because you have a, a progeny of a thousand, and then you have a 20 mapping unit between both genes as a hypothesis. So then your parentals will be 80%. Oh, did I make a mistake here? Okay, let's correct this while we're here. Sorry, guys. It's supposed to be half of that. <clears throat> mistakes, mistakes. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Um, if, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they're trying the null hypothesis is the one that you kind of refute. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, okay, terminology. That's, uh, if, if I fix this now, it's going to mess up the thing. Okay, just assume hypothesis and opposite hypothesis for me. Okay, I will uh, fix this later. And then the bottom here, the expected, do you understand this? How I got to these numbers? Yeah. So I'm talking about two genes that are 20 mapping units in between. So that means that the two genes have 20% recombinant frequency, okay? So 20% recombinant frequency, that means the recombinants will be 20% of the total progeny, which is 1,000. So 20% of 1,000 is 200. Now, these two are the recombinant. Why? Because we are talking about a cis configuration of two linked genes. So that means the parental will be this one and this one. 
which totals 80% of the progeny. Clear up to now? Good. Okay. More mistakes here, but we'll fix it later. Okay, so for this table here, uh, now that I fixed the other thing, it will be like this. But I'm not going to do it now because it's going to mess up the whole thing. But you know what? Why not? Let's recalculate. Genius. <laughs> yeah, but if I do 2000, I have to change the other one. <laughs> you see what I mean? Okay. Uh, give me, give me, give me, give me one second. I will, we'll do it now so you can see how I'm doing it anyways. So the expected is this. 100 and 400. Sorry for that. So 250 minus, so that's 150. And then this one here is, uh, what, 250. And then here it's 200 and minus 300. Okay, so this is wrong. This is wrong. Let me just do this right now. This is how you're supposed to solve the problem, okay? <laughs> do this on the, on the exam, you should be good. So minus 150 times minus 150, so that's 22,000. This here is 25,000. Uh, what do we do? No, 100. 252 seconds, guys. Plus 200 times 200. Okay, and then so we do one of these with twenty two divided by one fifty. Wait, what? Yeah, 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 sorry. Wait, wait, what? Sorry? Mm. Yep. Yeah. So this one, the bottom is 625, you said? 400, 225, Okay, so when you get these numbers, then you add them, right? So 56.25 plus 625 is 400. Okay, so then it gives you 1,309. Thousand three hundred uh oh six sorry. Huh? Oh I forgot the jeez. Uh, yeah, 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 sorry for that. Okay. Good. A plus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um so when you see a chi so this is what you're supposed to see, okay? I made a mistake of thinking about like percentages and not progeny so you multiply the percentage by the the uh, whole population and then you remember that there's two classes or you know okay so yeah what yeah okay better like this good <laughs> okay so when you see a large like number like this already you know that you're gonna reject it okay it should be like a small number that you are expecting. So then you have this number here, but let's say you're not sure and the number is small and you have to verify. So step number three would be to look at the degrees of freedom and to compare it to the p-value table. So since we have four gamete classes, then the, the, the degree of freedom is three, and then you compare it with the expected values 
on the table. And since we are looking for a significance level of 0 0.05 or 95% com confidence um, in our data, then you just go through that table and you find that we're looking at this number here, 7.815. Yeah. 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 I'll provide the table. So then if you compare, if you compare, so 693.75, you see that it, ex that it exceeds the critical value for the uh, 0 0.05 uh, confidence or significance level. So then we reject the hypothesis. Okay? So in this case, we say that um, gene A and gene B assort independently during meiosis. In this example, it was kind of clear because the observed, it looks like this, right? Almost clear, you know, this one here maybe is a bit weird, but still, um, if you do this, you'll have the answer no matter what. Does this make sense? Yeah? Sorry, I can't hear you at all. Yeah, still works because the expected values will change. It's it's rel relative to the expected values. So if you say that they are linked, they're not linked, then your expected values will be two. Uh, it's a th progeny of a thousand, so it would be two fifty, two fifty, two fifty, two fifty, and based on that, it will change your chi square value. Yeah. Is there a possibility that both hypotheses are not? True, yeah. Or question? Okay, I thought you wanted to uh, say something. Okay. Um, again, asking me some uh, exceptions here. I'm not sure. I don't think so. I'm uh, I'm I'm not sure if uh, there's a possibility that both of them are not, because you're comparing two things, right? So no matter what, it's relative to the. Um, to the observed and expected, so I don't see how that could happen. But I can answer you maybe next time. I'll, uh, I'll look it up. Um, yeah, one second. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so o, o stands for observed, and E stands for expected. And this is just a formula here that you have to follow to, to uh, count the chi-square value okay so chi square equals to the sum of this here so observed minus expected squared divided by expected i got you joe <laughs> you're gonna get tired like that um so so when you have your gametes so when you have the gametes like this by doing your test cross you observe that you observe these numbers here these are the ratios then these are your o column okay the expected, well, that depends on the question and your hypothesis. If your hypothesis is that they are um, not linked, then your expected values will be 250, 250, 250, 250, right? If you expect them that they are, are linked and your hypothesis is that they are linked, then it depends on if they are in a cis or trans configuration and if you have the mapping units between both genes. So then from there, you can calculate the ratios of that are expected based on this configuration. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. So then from there, you just have to do these calculations. So build your table like this. You would do O minus E for each one of them, and then you square that so that gives this number, and then you divide it by the expected, and at the end you add them all. All this, the last column, you add them all. And when you do that, it will give you a number, this chi-squared number, that you have to compare with a table of uh, confidence. Okay? Kind of clear? No? Okay, good. Yes, Joe. Okay. How much? 225? Okay. So... Um, I'll correct it again, like this. One thousand 
25. Okay. It's, uh, the, the idea remains the same, okay? Just the number here keep changing, but there you go. This is better. Okay. Thanks, uh, Joe. Any questions? Yeah? So if it was trans configuration, that's a very good question. That means the expected, so trans configuration means on one side you have big A, small b, and on the other you have small a, big b. So then the parental would be big A, small b, or small a, small b. So these would be the parental. So you would have an expected of 400 here, 400 here, and then 100, and the last 100. Okay? Good. If you had three genes, the table gets bigger. You can see that, right? Um, I don't know if uh, I'll see. I'll see. Uh, I have to test the exam, but you know, um, three may be taking too much time. Yeah. Uh, can you? Depends on the question. Depends on the question. Like in this case here, yeah, could work. Could work, I think. Let me just make sure of that too. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll think about it and then uh, I'll, I'll uh, tell you. No problem. Uh, technically, yes, but I don't want to say that and then you do it on the exam. And <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make sure and then I'll let you know. Okay, so is that clear, guys? Everything good? Yeah? Right, but um, so observed does not always, um, that's the thing, because what you observe in nature and what it actually is are two different things. But for this kind of problem that, the, that was given for you, you have to follow the problem, right? So it, technically, in theory, if I'm super lucky, I can get 10, like uh, let's say I'm playing rock, paper, scissor, I can get 10 times paper in a row, right? But the reality is that it's not going to happen. It's very rare. But let's say I'm doing this, right? And I'm just cheating the, the, the thing, right? So in that case, the observed will be different from what it is, actually. So you, th you base yourself on the expected, not on the observed, in this kind of problem. This is more of an experimental setup. If you are giving these numbers apart and then ask to find the gene in the middle and all that, then you assume that um, the more, um, the ones that are the most observed are the parental and the others are the recombinant. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in this case, we're just testing a hypothesis. Okay. Good. My uh, my father was uh, watching the lectures and he told me that I say too much. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I asked him. I was like, "When you teach, what do you say?" <laughs> and he's like, uh, "The students told me I say donk because he's in uh, physics, so he's always doing those proofs and derivatives and all that. So he's always like donk x equals donk, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it's his way of telling me, you know, I'm proud of you. I'm watching the the, the lectures. <laughs> he's retired now, so." always watching uh, TV and the politics, you know. <laughs> okay, so back to this. So chapter five, chapter five. Um, now it's getting a little bit more interesting, at least for me, than the other chapters, because uh, who wants to learn about peace? Um, we're gonna get into the more interesting stuff, so how genes interact in between each other, and uh, how does that affect us, bacteria, whatever, okay? I said it again. So, <laughs> so uh, there's this guy called George Beetle and his buddy Edward Tatham that found that there is one gene, one polypeptide in the past. And so they did some experiments to figure out this thing here because we didn't know really how this inheritance was happening at the molecular level. But these guys did an experiment with mutants of Neurospora and they found this um, or they actually produced this hy hypothesis which was confirmed later on. So you probably remember this from you know, your uh, CGEP or college or whatever. Uh, DNA gets converted into mRNA and then each of these codons will produce an amino acid. 
uh, when translated. So we'll see transcription in chapter 7, translation in, uh, cha translation chapter 9, and I forgot what's 8. Um, what's 8? Anyways, we'll see them in sequence, these three separately, so that we can understand how your genetic code actually makes you. So when there is a mutation in the DNA sequence, for example, there's a change in this nucleotide here, it affects the mRNA and then it affects the amino acid produced here, right? And then sometimes you have different types of mutations like deletions, insertions, etc. So a deletion would remove, let's say, one nucleotide and then shift everything else. And so because it shifts, then this here will not produce serine and all the amino acids after will be messed up. There's also the stop codons that can be, I'll get into detail later, but this is just an overview. The st stop codon can stop the protein right here and then not make the rest of the chain, and then you would have a smaller protein that has no function. Or it could also remove a regulatory region of the protein, and that makes the protein more active, or like uh, does not require a substrate. Cool? So a little bit about their experiment, but not too much into details. Uh, this looks like anything that you would be doing while you're working with yeast or bacteria. So usually you grow them in a media medium that is full, in uh, cell culture, so it has all the amino acids and all the essential vitamins and all that. But sometimes you can grow them also on a, a minimal media. So this minimal media does not have any of the amino acids or whatsoever. Uh, so what happens is that if you have a mutation in a gene required for um, to produce that amino acid, then um, you can't produce it yourself. So you need kind of a supplementation from you know, the scientist or researcher that's doing that. So what they did is that they looked, they used x-ray to mutate DNA at random, and they found that when growing the cells on different minimal media, so they have almost nothing in it, and then they supplement it with a specific amino acid, they found that these mutants required arginine um, as a supplement to be able to grow. And that usually means that there's a mutation in a gene that, that makes arginine for, um, for these uh, neurospore. Does that make sense? Good. So you would do this even for yeast. For example, when I was working with yeast, um, we had the same thing. So we had a strain that was mutant for four um, amino acids, and then I would grow it. I would have to add the amino acid into the media for it to grow. Uh, why is this relevant? These are called oxotrophs, meaning that it requires, it cannot produce a certain amino acid or whatever, and you need to supplement it. So why would we do this? For example, you have a yeast that does not grow on uh, arginine. Then what you can do is make a plasmid that has your own DNA of interest that you're studying, give it, uh, add to it the uh, arginine protein enzyme that makes the arginine and then suddenly they will start growing. So this will tell you that your bacteria or yeast or whatever now has your plasmid in it because now they're able to grow. And you do this also with um, antibiotics and all that. Okay, good. So what they looked also is that these mutants complement each other, meaning that when they made a cross, if the mutants were on different genes, then they would have a wild phenotype because one was able to complement the other. But if they were on the same gene, the mutants would actually have a mutant phenotype and not grow on uh, without any supplementation. At the end of this, they found a pathway. So they uh, coined the term for uh, metabolic pathway. And they found that there is a pathway that converts um, a precursor into ornithine, then citrulline, then arginine, which are necessary for the cell. And they found that the mutants expressed different needs in terms of supplementation. For example, a mutant in arginine 1 required supplementation with all three amino acids. Well, wow, this amino acid and these intermediates kind of. If it was arginine 2, then it would re require supplementation in citrulline and arginine. If it was arginine 3, it means it requires supplementation for arginine. Okay? And the only thing that these enzymes do is that it converts the ornithine into citrulline by adding a carboxyl group, and then here by doing an amination reaction and adding this little thing here, DNH, okay? So then from this table here, we're able to see what gene comes, what uh, in the pathway, what protein comes before the other. So if we look at this here, the biosynthetic pathway starts with a precursor that is converted to ornithine by ARG1. 
And why do we know that orange one is the first one? It's because if you mutate it, you don't produce ornithine, you don't produce citrulline, and you don't produce arginine because you don't convert the precursor to ornithine. And so that's why it needs a supplementation in all of them. And then we know that arginine 2 is right in the middle because it only requires citrulline and arginine, which are here. And then arginine arg3 or whatever this mutant um, comes in between of citrulline to arginine. Does that make sense? What, how is this happening? Okay. Um, so it seems that when you mutate arg1, you need to put all three of them for the cells to grow. If you don't put all three, they will not live. Arg2, because it's right here, then you need to put citrulline and arginine, and then same thing for the last one. So, yeah. Uh, no, so you would do them one by one. You would separate it. You would separate all the supplements, and then you would gr try to grow them in different supplements and see where it grows. And then when you find the one, if you don't find any, that means you probably have to combine two. And then if you fi don't find any combination two, you need to combine three. See what I mean? And then you'll find all the genes that are uh, mutated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so when, when this mutant here, this single mutant, so mutant only in one gene, ARG3, does not grow when there's no ornithine. Uh, no, does not require ornithine to grow because it can produce it from the uh, precursor. Does not require citrulline because it can produce it from ornithine but requires arginine because it cannot make arginine because the enzyme that makes ar arginine is messed up. Make sense? If you break it at the beginning of the chain, then you need all of them because you're missing all the intermediates after. If you break it at the end of the chain, you only need uh, one of them. Yeah? <clears throat> yeah, that makes sense. But um, in reality, um, you need... So if you put only ornithine... Let me think about this before I say something wrong. So if you put ornithine, it can still make citrulline and arginine. And then... Uh, sorry. The table means that they grow in the supplement. The table means that they grow in the supplement. So when you supplement ornithine, they will grow. When you supplement citrulline, they will grow. The plus means grow, not uh, need to be supplemented. Sorry for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. sorry. So let me uh, repeat that to be clear, okay? The plus does not mean you put the supplement. The plus means that it grows in there. Does that make sense? So in this case, when you put ornithine here, obviously it will grow because it can make citrulline and arginine. But here, this one here, you, if you put citrulline and arginine, um, it will grow because it can produce the others. And then I see this you, okay? Yeah, thanks for uh, catching that up. So the plus does not mean you put the supplement. The plus means that you are, uh, it means that they grow under those conditions. Good call. So the pathway looks like this. Actually, it's a lot more complex than this, but this is part of the pathway. And they propose this hypothesis that the protein made could be an enzyme and that this enzyme would convert, you know, the precursor into ornithine and all that, right? And so if you had a mutation, let's say in ARG2, then let's say, for example, the cat catalytic site um, is removed or blocked because of this mutation then you can't convert ornithine to citrulline, right? So this is why you need to supplement. Make sense? Okay, good. So I want to show you something first, <laughs> and then we'll get to uh, 
what I want to show here. So if you want to look at these pathways for yourself, last time I showed you how to look at the DNA and all that. So you can go on Google or Bing and then write Reactome and then click here. And then, I don't know, you could write uh, arginine, arginine, citrulline, or whichever pathway. Let's just write this, urea and cycle. Okay, so you can look at the pathways. And if you click here, you can explore the pathways. For example, one that you know very well is uh, glycolysis, right? But there is a lot of different ones. Um, and you can see here the, um, what is it? Citrulline, ornithine, arginine, all that, okay? And then if you zoom out completely, the, 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 the how do you call it? The pathways are like crazy, okay? There's uh, thousands of proteins linked to each other, okay? So how do these pathways affect us? This is my, re my PhD research, okay? I uh, was doing research on aging, mostly on metabolism. And metabolism is just a kind of, the pathways are just a conversion of one precursor to an intermediate, et cetera, okay? So if you, I have to stop saying, okay. If you, <laughs> so when you look at these pathways, they have an effect on us. And they have an effect on many of the processes that, um, that control uh, human physiology. For example, one way and the most, um, the most efficient way to extend lifespan, so the life of cells, is to actually put them on a diet and to make them fast. Because what happens is that when you make them fast, they will stop getting into this mode of just grow because they have too much amino acids, too much sugar, too much, and make these uh, radicals and all that, which kind of break the cells. So what they do is they get into this mode of like, oh, there's not enough food. Now I need to repair what I already have and also reuse what I already have. And because they get into this mode, they're able to live much longer. And this was shown to work in, in mice and in different organisms, right? So one thing that is done in, uh, for humans is intermittent fasting, if you ever heard of this. Uh, some people are a little bit crazy about this because they do like 18 hours of fasting and then six hours of eating. Um, but the effects have been shown in many different, um, in many different aspects of human health. For example, if you have diabetes type two, you can reverse that effect by just fasting. If you have um, inflammation problems, same thing, etc. Yes, Joe. Yeah, autophagy gets, so, this is like unrelated, but it's uh, important to know because what happens is that when the cells get these nutrients, they will activate certain pathways and those pathways have a downstream effect on a certain process. And so if you give the cells too much food, they don't care about the rest. They, they're just in growth mode and they just produce too much radicals and, uh, and then that will affect the cells. So autophagy, uh, starts around 14 hours of fasting and that autophagy is basically just recycling whatever you have in the cell that's broken to reuse it okay so if you want to do this it's very hard to do like uh, in terms of discipline but it's very good for your health especially if you have a disease like uh, diabetes or things like this sounds good so in my research I was trying to reproduce the fasting um, state of the cell but without fasting. So I would kind of affect different genes that were part of the pathway and then try to mutate them or inhibit them and see if they did the same effect as the restriction in terms of food. This way you don't, you can keep eating, but you know, throw everything out. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. So actually um, I made a, so I tried like, I forgot how many, 89, 86, something like this of um, groups of molecules and I found five of them that are super efficient. One of them is increases the lifespan of the cells by five times and it does activate this rep these repair pathways. Um, the, so the discoveries that I made were part of the Titorenko's lab um, but then they were used to produce these supplements for the pharmacy and they're sold right now in the pharmacy. Uh, if you go you can find them. It's called Vitoli. So it's nothing clinical yet but the main guy of the study there, he, not the study, but the main investor, uh, turned them into supplements, right? Make sense? 
I didn't get anything, but this is life. <laughs> I got papers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the work is published. Uh, went on TV. The whole, the whole, the whole thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was uh, it was good while it lasted, but you know, usually the university gets uh, most of the <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, it's okay. Got me a lot of publications and then helped me for my career. But, um, you know, financially speaking, uh, <laughs> I'm here teaching, okay? <laughs> Vitoli. V-I-T-O-L-I. -I Vitoli. Yeah. And uh, the company that makes them is called Edon Technologies. Edon is a word that means life or age. So, question for you guys. A, mutation, a metabolic pathway has been identified where enzyme 1 converts precursor A into B, and then enzyme 2 converts B into C, 3, C into D. Which statement about this pathway is true? Anybody? Sorry? Is it? Mm, yeah. <laughs> okay, it is A. So when you get a question like this, just put the pathway together on paper, and then you can answer the question from there. So if you mutate one, that means you can produce B, but you can still produce C and D. So then you can rescue this by supplementing either C or D, okay? Or B, yeah, just not in the answer there. Make sense? Okay, good. Not, not, I mean, we have to simplify it, right? In reality, no. Uh, it's a bit more complex than this, but in this case, yeah. <laughs> We're saying that D is essential, and so you need to get to D. Okay. But in reality, no. Each one of them is important, some less than others, etc. Good. So this is where it gets serious. So we learned about one gene, one phenotype, and then two, mute, two alleles, one that works and one that doesn't work. But actually, it's a lot more complex than that because we have 20 to 25,000 genes. Um, and so there's no way that you can imagine that they don't interact between each other. And so there's complex gene interactions that happen. Sometimes we see more than two alleles. Actually, all the time we see more than two alleles. And so we have to take into that into consideration. And then when we talk about a dominant phenotype, if you remember early on during the semester when we talked about uh, Mendel, when he made this hypothesis that genes don't blend, kind of. Actually, they do a little bit. Not the gene itself, but the phenotypes, they do blend. Okay, And so there's a few other different types of uh, inheritance that exist, and we'll cover all of them, um, some today, some next lecture. So there's incomplete dominance, co-dominance, recessive lethal alleles, and then obviously three or more alleles in the gene. Um, you also have multiple genes that affect the same trait. So this we call redundancy. So if you remove one, the other still does the job. And if you remove one completely, the other still does the job. And so you don't see what's happening. And then there's epistasis where genes affect each other. So the molecular basis for this is quite simple. Um, you have to think of it as a gene produces one polypeptide or one protein not one, but produces a protein. And so when we're talking about a homozygous dominant, we can imagine that it's making the maximum amount of protein possible, right? And then if you have a heterozygote, one of the alleles will not produce, let's say, uh, proteins, and the others will produce one dose of proteins. And that will give you, for example, a thousand proteins. And then the homozygous recessive will have uh, zero proteins. And you can see how this can affect kind of the, make it less black and white. So either you have it or you don't have it, okay? So for the dominant phenotype, there's a few things that we have to think about. First of all, there's a concept of haploinsufficiency, which means that even though you have a dominant allele, um, it's not sufficient to produce the amount of proteins that you need for a healthy um, phenotype. And so this we call haploinsufficiency. For example, if one allele produces a thousand and you need three, uh, if one allele produces a thousand and then the mutant produces 500 and you need, let's say, 2000, so then it's not sufficient to have just one of them. You need all of them. Does that make sense? 
Okay, good. Then there is also dominant negative. So dominant negative means that when you have it, it messes up already the phenotype, but it's because it makes one healthy protein, the wild type allele, and then the mutant dominant will make a messed up protein, and then they will interact together, let's say, in a complex. And because that one is messed up, it messes up the function of the healthy one. Make sense? For example, if you look here at the dominant negative, you have this dimer here, or two proteins together. And then if one of them, if both of them are messed up, obviously it doesn't work. But if one of them is messed up, it could make the other not work by binding to it. Cool? Easy? Exactly. Exactly. And so the middle one, the heterozygous, is dominant negative, meaning that it has one healthy, one not healthy, but because the non-healthy affects the healthy, it's dominant, but negative, no effect. And then mutations can also acquire, uh, mutants can also acquire new function. For example, yep. Um, here? No, no, this is not haploinsufficient. This is the whole thing is haploinsufficient. So here it's the healthy. This works. This works. The first lane works. You have to look at the phenotype. The haplo haploinsufficiency is this one here at the bottom, one dose. Make sense? And then the dominant negative is this one here. So mutants acquire new function. So here, there's a protein that I'm studying right now. It's called the estrogen-related receptor, and it affects breast cancer. So we found in clinical samples that there's a mutation, just one little nucleotide, changes its ability to bind to different proteins, including the androgen receptor and things like this, and this makes the cancer grow faster. So this is one thing where you have a new function, where the protein kind of, just because of one amino acid changing, the conformation changes, and now it allows binding to other proteins. Make sense? So this is what happens in research. Look at these beautiful snapdragons. <laughs> so incomplete dominance, this is where the blending, the blending happens. So in this case, the heterozygote is a mix of both the homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive. It's kind of in between. And you can imagine this as being, as being uh, in terms of doses of proteins. So let's say, for example, you have the R gene that makes uh, the, rose, the petals uh, pink like this. And then if you don't have it, the null allele will make it white. And so you can imagine that the heterozygous has just half of the amount of the pigment, and so it becomes pink compared to this one, which is darker or stronger pink. Make sense? Okay, so when you cross, so let's say, for example, exam or situation where you're crossing um, two pure breeding lines. Oops, sorry. So that are, that are following this incomplete dominance um, phenotype, the F1 will be kind of all in the middle between the two parents. And then if you self these, the F1, then you can get back the initial, the initial phenotypes because it follows still a three to one ratio. But then the phenotypic ratio is, a, uh, the genotypic ratio is a bit, uh, is the same. So it's one to two to one, but the phenotypic ratio changes. It's not three to one. It's one to two to one, because the homozygous dominant is this color. The two that are heterozygous are uh, light pink, and then the one that is homozygous recessive is white. Does that make sense? Good. Did I say a lot of okay today? Not bad. <laughs> okay, question. So frizz frizzled fowl, I have no idea what frizzled fowl is, but frizzled, I know what it is, okay? <laughs> Is a, it's a character that is found in chicken. Let's just assume like weird hair or <laughs> which causes the feathers to curl up. So frizzled chickens do not breed true. Do you, do you understand what this means? The frizzled chicken do not breed true. It means that you don't have um, pure frizzled and pure uh, normal. It's like an intermediate. It should tell you that it's an intermediate phenotype when it says it does not breed true. It means that um, there's two phenotypes, which is uh, no feathers and then 
feathers, and then you have the middle one that is frizzled. So that's why it says it does not breed true. Okay, so when you see this, think about incomplete dominance. So a cross between two frizzled individuals results in one to two to one, where you have normal frizzled feathers and then strange feathers. Okay, so then they're asking you to give the genetic explanation for this trait. I guess I just gave it to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, incomplete. Right. So, haploinsufficiency. So, the, th the, the thing is uh, just in the trait you're studying. So, haploinsufficiency means you don't have enough proteins to do a certain function. In the case of petals, it could be considered incomplete dominance. But in the case of something that, um, a, a function that is different uh, to just having a color, for example, you need a specific amount of protein to have a specific effect, then that we call it haploinsufficiency. Make sense? So you don't have an in-between uh, with haploinsufficiency for that sense. You have either function or no function. But incomplete dominance still has the middle ground that shows the color, but it does not have any effect on any function. Make sense? Yeah, same thing, same same thing. So when we talk about haploinsufficiency, you have to think about protein amount, okay? So anyone? Yeah, yeah, it's D. So this trait is controlled by one gene with alleles with incomplete dominance. So when they say frizzle chickens do not breed true, it means that these are not a pure line, right? And then if they tell you three different phenotypes, you have to think about incomplete dominance. And so frizzled is the middle one, and then there's two other phenotypes, normal feathers and uh, woolly feathers. Cool? Yep. How do you figure out if it's two genes or one gene? It's affecting the same trait, right? It could be two genes affecting the same trait, right? Because there's redundancy, as I said, multiple genes affecting the same trait. But in this case, in this case, I'm talking about only one gene. If I specify that there's uh, two genes and one of them, if it's mutated, the other does the job, then you have to think about two genes. Cool? Okay, so this is it. You can just do the uh, cross like this, and you'll get these progeny, which is one quarter normal, one quarter, well, half frizzled, and then one quarter naked. Sorry, forgot. <laughs> it will come back. Um, so in this case, there's a different way that we can also write the, the, the genotype. You can just put big F for the healthy one or the normal one, and then big F, small z. It should be, uh, I could work like this too, uh, frizzled. And then, uh, yeah, that's it. So, big, so they are both capital F, but only the fr the frizzle one will be with a superscript or subscript. Yeah. Yeah. You can write it that way also. You just need to keep in mind that um, it's in complete dominance, and that's it. Yeah, everyone comes and makes their way of writing stuff. It's just. The, the, the idea is one dominant allele and one recessive allele. And now which one uh, in, uh, relative to the other one? Cool. Okay. So frizzled chicken have become a big seller at Easter. That's not my question. Okay. I have to hear from someone else. <laughs> what cross would you make to maximize the production of these frizzled chicken for the market? This. B. Cross a normal with a naked chicken. Exactly. Exactly. Does that make sense? Good. Good, good, good. Okay. Codominance. Something a little bit more interesting than chicken. So, codominance means that both alleles get expressed at the same time. And so, when we're talking about blood type, for example, there's three different alleles that exist, right? 
the IA, IB, and then small a. So I, let's just call them A, B, and I, okay? So if you have this allele, you produce the A antigen on your blood cells. And when you have the A antigen on your blood cells, your body is able to recognize that it's your own blood. If you have the B antigen on them, same, same story. And then if you have the AB blood type, that means you produce both, um, both uh, antigens. And so they're both found on the um, blood cell. And this is why you can't give blood to anybody and receive from anybody. Because when you have the A antigen on your, on, when you have these two alleles, let's say a homozygous for the IA, then your cells will have the A antigen and your body will produce the B, ant the B antibody. And so it will react with anything that is B. Make sense? So this is why you don't give blood randomly like this because it can actually cause an immune response and kill you. So that's one thing. And then if you have the AB, which is one allele that is IA and one allele that is IB, then you produce both antigens and you don't have any of the antibodies in your blood. So then that means you can receive from anybody, right? Because you don't have the antibodies to do the reaction. There's a third, a fourth one, which I'll come back to in a bit. But let's look at how you can get the blood type that you have right now. So when you cross two individuals that have uh, A blood type and B blood type, which is determined like this, you produce, so B, uh, I, big A, homozygous for the I and homozygous for, for the B, okay? Then you end up with, your again, your similar one to two to one ratio. The only difference is that now the middle ones are co-dominant. So they express both the I, uh, the B and the A antigen. And so this one becomes a blood type AB, right? And then these two are either a B or A, blood type A or B. This is what we call by what we what we mean by codominance, is that both alleles are expressed, and so in the, an example for the blood the blood type AB, you have both alleles being expressed. There's also another type of dominance or not dominance but inherited genes called uh, recessive lethal. So when you have two copies that are recessive of this gene. Um, now, when you have, yeah, exactly. When you have two copies, you end up uh, just dying. So you don't see that um, that offspring. And so just one thing to make it clear, not all genes are necessary for, um, for living. Most of them are useless in terms of uh, lethality, but there's a few of them that you absolutely need to live. And this has been like this for all evolution. And so when you have when you have a mutation, a homozygous for that allele, you do not produce a zygote. The zygote will die. And so you will not see it in the uh, progeny. So an example of that is the tailless cat or the Manx allele. So tailless cat is a dominant mutation and it affects the uh, um, spinal, what do you call it? Colon vertebral, the uh, spinal cord. There you go. Um, and so, because you have this allele, if you are in the heterozygous state, you'll end up not making a tail, but you'll still live. If you have a homozygous for this allele, you will die because your spine will be too messed up. And then if you have the other homozygous state, then you'll end up with a normal tail looking like this, right? And so the heterozygous is tailless because of the dominant mutation that affects the spine a little bit so that there's no tail, but not too much to kill. The, the cat or the zygote. When you have a situation like this, sometimes the heterozygous will also have a wild type phenotype. And this is just how much each allele is producing in terms of protein, because they're not like 100% 50-50 like you imagine it in your head, okay? Sometimes you will still see in the general population wild type phenotype, even though it's a heterozygous for, a, uh, for this Manx allele, okay? So if we take, um, so then if we look at these cats, remember it's a dominant allele. In this case, the writing changes. So when we say it's a dominant allele, we have to write it like this. And then the wild type one becomes like this. It's the opposite of what we've seen for the um, recessive alleles at the beginning of chapter two and three. Cool? So, so this means that 
this allele is dominant and it will have an effect on the um, on the progeny and so when we take a a cat with a tail and then uh, cross it with a tailless cat and then it also affects the color of their thing but that's useless for us okay so um, if we cross them like this you'll end up with a one-to-one -one ratio right but we learn so you'll end up wait one second let me just see one thing yeah you'll end up with a one-to-one -one ratio like this for the f1 and then if you cross the heterozygous together you'll end up with a weird ratio and the, the reason for this weird ratio is that the homozygous for this allele dies and so you don't see it in the progeny instead what you see is the heterozygote that has no no tail and then the homozygous that has the tail this is the wild type and now it's a bit weird right because you see wild type with two small m's so in this case you have to think about it this way okay when we're talking about dominant alleles uh, in terms of like a phenotype the big one is the dominant allele and then the wild type would put it as uh, two small letters cool a lot of conventions I know but this is what scientists like to do um, right so then you will end up with a two to one ratio instead of a one to two to one how do we know that this actually happens well scientists can actually look at the zygotes first and then see if they're they're made and then if they end up making progeny then that would become a one to two to one if they don't that we know that it's a lethal allele so how do we know in a question or let's say in a situation that it's recessive lethal first of all the progeny from the cross is two to one the f2 cross uh, the f2 progeny and then this trait cannot made to be to breed true because if you have two alleles of that trait which is the manx uh, allele here this one here it will die right so you can't really have it breed Make sense? So you only have one pure line, let's say, and it's the healthy one. There are ways to study these lethal alleles um, in what's called a um, temperature sensitive mutant. So you can actually make the proteins um, act normal at a certain temperature and then messed up at a different temperature and then just by heating up your cells or whatever, you can activate it or deactivate it. So this is used a lot in research because there's some proteins that are necessary for um, for living, right? Especially those that act on aging and growth. Those are, if you remove them, the, the cells will die. So how do you study them? You have to play with their temperature so that you can make them activated whenever you need them or not. This is unrelated to the course. I know you read it in your book, but you will cover these in like uh, bio, biology 461, the advanced genetics if you ever take it. Pretty cool class.